my name is Jay Murdoch. Uh, I've with, been with Owens Corning probably about 15 years all in, uh, recovering. I went to architecture school a long time ago. I had good hair. Uh, I was a home builder, and my wife is still a practicing architect. So all my, a lot of friends that work for big Turner Construction, uh, uh, they're home builders still, so I get to live vicariously through them. So I'm going to cover a couple things that, so I, I spent October, November, December calling a bunch of architects and calling a bunch of electricians, some of my old subs, just to ask them what their trends were. Um, I'm not going to go into, if you subscribe to a variety of different journals and newsletters, NHB doc, uh, publications that are telling you all the different trends, I'm not going to cover those because I think those are pretty well documented. I'm going to try to draw out what is unique that I heard from some of my builder friends and subcontractor friends. Uh, because we have lawyers at Owens Corning, I had to clean that up a little bit. So I had to like take out some of the, the, the character of, of uh, some of the things that my, my buddy shared with me. So really, I, you know, are we home builders folks right here? Are you home builders? Okay. Distributor. Distributor. And whereabouts? Alaska. Alaska. All right. All right. Fantastic. Uh, and everyone else is Owens Corning people. Yeah. So. So I, got, I figured out who's in the room. I got that part done. I'm going to cover long, I'm going to very quickly go over some long standing issues. So when I was calling builders and trade subcontractors, they wanted to talk about a whole bunch of different things that I think have been um, in place ever since they were building the pyramid. So I think there's some consistent things that every builder or contractor has been dealing with forever. Uh, I'll hit on a couple trends that are hitting home for the, the different trades today. Um, I'll, I'll kind of paint a picture of what's coming at you in the next couple years that you may not see what, what's coming at you. I'll also talk about some solutions. You know, at the end of the day, as a builder, when I was building houses, um, my world was like uh, two counties. That was my entire world. So you've all seen the map of New York City, where New York City's huge, and there's a little part of Jersey, and everything else gets small. My world was two or three counties in the District of Columbia. I was in Washington, D.C., building houses. Um, so I use my supply chain and my manufacturer's chain to try to solve my problems. So some of the long-standing issues, I've got to move over here because I can't even see from the glare. So some of them are basic business operation stuff, business 101, uh, and then there's some design, construction, and code issues. So for the business operations 101, labor, 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 it's, a, it's, it's, not, it's not news to you. Um, getting access to some of the subcontractors who are doing work in homes, existing homes, as opposed to new construction. They had to have a higher standard of care who they hired because they're sending someone into someone's occupied home. So their criminal background record, DUI, all those other things they had to take a look at. Um, financials 101, cash flow and profit margin. It's a, it's a notorious thing, but it, it's really amazing how many subcontractors they're making money. They don't know why they're making money. They don't know what their profit margins are. They don't know what their sweet spot is in terms of scope of work and job. So it's, it's amazing that that stuff's still out there, uh, but it's out there. Uh, reading plans and specifications to able to read a set of blueprints continues to be a problem with some trades. They're just not trained <clears throat> you know, to understand, read a set of blueprints and look at how the framing should go and how the how the plumbing needs to be split on maybe hopefully not a joist, all these other things uh, that they continue to have. And that ripple effects into, that has a ripple effect into putting together a good estimating and bid package. If you can't read the plans and specs, how are you going to put an accurate bid package together? And if you can't read a set of plans and specs, you're not asking the right questions to get, us to, get to a smart bid package. Um, change order, capture, and management. That's a sink call. Actually, for two builder friends, small builders in my area, I do the change orders for them to this day. Uh, their wife is the CFO in the office doing the billing and paying. And I just, because they're my buddies, I was like, just send me what your change orders are. And I do them for them, send them back to the, their spouse who does all the change orders. Otherwise, they wouldn't get, they wouldn't get paid for them. Uh, they're great carpenters, so these, these trades are really, really good at what they're doing. Whether it's an HVAC installation contractor or electrician, they are not by nature good at doing paperwork. So that's the, that can be their sinkhole in profitability and get them in a lot of trouble. Um, succession planning is, is a bit of an issue. If my kids don't want the business, what am I going to do with those are some Those are some issues. Now the design and construction issues that I run into, and this is, again, it's, this is not a new trend, this is everywhere. Even on my wife's own jobs, I'm like, hey, you haven't provided a chase for HVAC and plumbing. 
there's nowhere to run all your mechanicals. So frustration from builders are just basic neglect like that. The National Electrical Code, and I don't know why this came up so much, but there was a lot of kind of angst around the outlets, the National Electrical Code, and where outlets are required in the kitchen. Because you've got these fancy kitchens, uh, you've got a countertop, a wall, and maybe that wall is glass, not a lot of cabinets, and there's nowhere to put the outlets to meet the National Electrical Code. So um, today's job inspectors, uh, uh, building inspectors, they've not come up through the trades like in my day, the, the, the plumbing inspector was an ex-plumber. Uh, a lot of the inspectors today are classroom trained and they don't have that field experience. Uh, inconsistent application of the code, uh, if in, uh, uh, in Fairfax County, the People's Republic of Fairfax County of Virginia, I have three inspectors that interpret the same code differently. I just wish they could be consistent in their application of the code. Material th theft, um, I think when I was doing my purchasing, I thought I, I, I had been the largest pur purchaser of 25 foot measuring tapes you know, in the nation. So where they went, I don't know. I learned to spray paint them orange that were mine. Um, yeah, so, and, and fighting low quality competition on the bid price. So that's just a frustration. So these are, these are not new trends. These are universal and there are a whole bunch of others. All right, so macro trends, some very high level trends that um, really are hard to, you're not gonna be able, to, it's not gonna show up in your, in your bid package. It's, you're not even gonna know it's kinda there, but these are, I call the, the silent things impacting your business. So for any subcontractor servicing the home building industry, uh, all of these things are conspiring against more people building houses, qualifying for houses, or getting into homes. So it's, it's not really on your radar. You see a lot of news about this, but immigration reform, and I'm sorry, but in many parts of the country, we just don't have the labor to go ahead and do the work. Legal immigration reform is needed so, for, so, so that labor can come into the marketplace. Dodd-Frank reform, that has to deal with whether people can qualify for a mortgage. Housing finance reform, qualifying for a mortgage. Student loan debt, uh, kids today have $100,000, $200,000 in debt. That's gonna postpone them buying a house for five, seven, maybe 10 years. So that's gonna be a drag. Again, it doesn't show up in your local business because it's such a high level. Tariffs, the tariffs recently, you've seen them in the news. Uh, softwood lumber from Canada, uh, steel and aluminum. Uh, flood insurance, wetlands, some, things are, some of these are very, very unique and specific to you. Uh, the Stafford Act, so all this federal money flowing into Texas and the Carolinas because of the flood and hurricane rebuilds, with that money, $2 billion is going into Harris County, Texas, and Houston for the rebuilds. But with that comes all these strings attached that people don't fully understand. And that drives up the cost of your housing or delay the, your project cycle times. So some trends that are hitting the, the trades today. So legalized marijuana kept coming up all the time. Now, that's not just unique to subcontractors, it's everybody across the board, but the subcontractors don't have an HR department or personnel department. Uh, they may not have an employee manual. They don't have the band of resources to figure out, hey, how do I deal with this law that says, like, this guy's allowed to smoke weed? Uh, and how do I, do I cut them off? And for medical purposes, it becomes another issue if they've got legal reasons to use marijuana. So that is an unknown thing right now that uh, some, some subcontractors are working through. Um, safety, uh, the OSHA, even though this current uh, administration has kind of postponed the confined spaces rule, OSHA has a rule out. It's not going away because the administration has said, well, we'll put a stay of execution on that thing. But for confined spaces, so in a tight crawl space or a really tight attic, there are good standards of practice of you can't just send someone into that attic or that crawl space uh, to go work by themselves. You've got to have someone monitoring to make sure that they're okay. So how to comply with that? The structural requirements for wind load and load paths and all the hurricane clips, some of these issues really aren't new. They've been in the code for a couple generations, maybe two or three editions, but candidly, they've not really been enforced. And all of a sudden, we're getting questions from framers saying, hey, what's going on? Or builders saying, I've got this new code requirement. It's like, well, actually, it's been in the code for a couple cycles. It's just never been enforced. So we're starting to see enforcement of old code provisions. Uh, sprinklers. Uh, energy code issues with respect to doing blower door tests. So at the, at the builder show, some, you're, you're probably doing blower door, you've probably been doing it for 15, 20 years in Alaska. 
but it's very new in certain markets. Oh, you've been doing them? No, I'm Alaska. Oh, you're Alaska. I'm oh, sorry. You're doing Well, it's, it's a new phenomenon to a lot of builders uh, to do a blower door test, uh, an air leakage test for the envelope. Same thing with duct leakage. The HVAC contractors are starting to have to do duct leakage testing. Oh, you're in California. Okay. Well, California, you know, you guys are special. You do everything right, right? Well, you, you, anyway, the, the energy code in California has been very strict, um, and you've been the leader, although some people are catching up, you know, yeah. Um, exterior insulation, continuous exterior insulation. So that's, uh, you put like, hey, we make uh, pink foam. We love pink foam on exterior houses. But the marketplace reality is some builders just aren't cool. They're not comfortable doing it. They have fear of it. So they don't want to do that if the code requires it. They're trying to find some other way to, to maneuver in the code. Um, oh, I love this one. And I, this is one I had to clean up a little bit. Designed by social media. <laughs> so, you know, my, my, my tile, the tile contractors are sick and tired of hearing someone saying, oh, I just want this. And, and the, the tile guy's like, well, give me, give me some specs. What's the grout color? What's the tile? You know, and, and uh, so designed by Pinterest is actually it's, it's a phenomenon I've never heard of. Uh, that, uh, you know, the builder's like, I need a set of drawings and plans. I need to do a change order. I can't do a screenshot of your Pinterest page and do a change order. So that was very interesting. Indoor air quality, consumer are hyper-focused and paranoid about indoor air quality. They don't necessarily know what it is. It could be uh, VOCs from chemicals off-gassing of whatever's going on. It could be mold and mildew because they're hyper-focused uh, on their children and their infants. But that seems to be something that causes fear and concern in a lot of, with a lot of trades. Comfort issues, um, all the HVAC issues on manual J, manual D, and how do you size your equipment and duct le le leakage, that's been in the codes and standards for quite some time. In certain markets, we're finally seeing enforcement of it. So it's, it's not a new thing. It's just now it's gotten sunshine on it and focus on it. Um, let me see. Uh, no one reads plans. Um, yeah, building department experience. So this is a, after, after the recession, the Great Recession, uh, all these people left the housing market, okay? Building departments, their talent got let go because they're dependent on, guess what, permits. So the revenue for talent, gone. Uh, home builders, all the intellectual capital, the people who know how to do construction practices, build the right way, they all left. So the training up a whole new cadre of how to do things has been very frustrating. Now. These are easily solved by the builders looking to your supply chain, building manufacturers, and even building departments to probably solve some of your problems. I'm gonna jump down from like all trades down to like our primary contractors, the installation contractor, our primary cu uh, customer is the installation contractor. So I've got a list of issues and some proposed solutions. So in terms of the is list of issues, uh, the confined spaces rule, there's, there's training that uh, OSHA reps do around the country, you can go ahead and fix, f help you with that. Uh, uh, concern by some uh, builders um, and around the use of spray foam in a house to make sure that no one else is in the house while you're applying the spray foam. So SPFA, which is a trade association for the spray foam industry, has outstanding, outstanding training for the appropriate way to apply spray foam, making sure you've got all the fully body, all full body armor on, making sure you're treating the house appropriately and no one else is in the room. So that's an easy solution. Those, they have some great best practices from that organization. Um, oh, envelope, I'm gonna jump to this particular one. This is the envelope leakage and air tightness, and I'm also gonna say duct blaster tests. So there are best practice trainings that actually, I'll flip through some examples of what Owens Corning does, and other manufacturers do the same thing. We train up a lot of our customers to do blower door, duct blaster, uh, insulation, uh, installation 101, which is amazing we have to do that, but we have to do that. Um, and other health and safety trainings. Um, unvented attics, uh, solar in battery in the code. So California is one of the first to adopt solar into the building code. So traditionally you had a sandbox. The energy code was a small sandbox of insulation, HVAC, windows, hot water heaters. Those are the typical levers you would use to meet the energy code. But in 2015 and the 2016 code, California introduced solar as, a, um, as an option, a compliance option. So in the 2016 Energy Code, uh, the California Energy Commission had moved, made improvements to the envelope. Um, and at the 11th hour, 
um, the Energy Commission said, oh, if you don't want to do those improvements in the envelope, just put some panels on a roof. So that's, that's been very interesting and disruptive. We're starting to see use of mineral wool in wildland fire zones and in New England. So uh, in wall cavities, so in wildland fire zones, typically you're looking at your site to get rid of all the debris, the fuel, and then, then you're cladding. Really, the, the fire, wildland fire code doesn't get into the cavity insulation, so it's really not needed. It's, it's kind of over-designed. Nonetheless, the marketplace in Sonoma is starting to use a lot of mineral wool in the wall, wall cavities just because. And in New England, same thing. We're starting to see use of mineral wool in wall cavities, where fiberglass cellulose would work fine. So there are a bunch of different options out there for trainings, but it, you just have to kind of go ahead and ask. So here's an example. So the one thing I have to train some of our installation contractor customers, you really need to know if you're servicing your builder, what compliance path they're using in the energy code. You've got a prescriptive path, which is those cute little tables saying this is where you put your envelope R values and your window specs. And then you've got another prescriptive path, but that's, they can use a software called like ResCheck. It's a DOE software tool that does a, a U value analysis. That's one other tool. Then you've got a performance path. So in California, it's 99% performance. You're hiring an energy consultant or HERS rater to model the house and get you to the whatever target you have for the energy code or above at whatever price point you're trying to get to. And then we have something new in the international energy conservation called the energy rating index, so ERI. That's similar to HERS. They couldn't use HERS, the home energy rating language from ResNet, because it was proprietary, it was trademarked and whatnot. So, you're, so it, it's, it's really inter, it's, it's important to know what, what your marketplace is doing. Are you using prescriptive, performance, or ERI? Because myself, as an HVAC contractor or an installation contractor, um, if I'm an installation contractor, I really prefer that prescriptive path because it says put an R20 in the wall. Um, if I'm an HVAC contractor, I probably prefer that prescriptive path. When you go to performance, the builders have the flexibility to trade things off. So you know what, I don't want to go to two by uh, six, I want to stay with two by four. So I'm going to move that R20 to back to a 13 and I'm going to make up for it with a hot water, better hot water heater. So it's really important to know uh, what your builders are using. So typically a smaller builder is using prescriptive and your big large performance, uh, big production builders are using a performance path. They're trading everything off. They're hiring a consultant. Um, uh, down here, uh, do you require software? So it's really just in this performance path we have to have a, use a software. In California, it's CBEC or something like that. Um, uh, this is the, uh, does it require third party verification? So um, someone will come in and inspect your insulation installation. Make sure it's aligned with your air barrier. They'll do a blower door test and duct blaster test. So none of these, sec none of these pathways in the code require third party. People believe beyond California, that you have to use a third party under the IECC if you're doing performance, that's not true. In the ERI path that's coming, it's still young, it's not being used, you gotta use a third party inspector. So in the IECC technically, uh, which is the energy code adopted by most states, your installation contractor can put a blower door on that house and give it air leakage number. Your, bless you, the HVAC contractor can do a duct blaster test and put a number on their certificate. And generally that's okay for the building department. Owens Corning always recommends you use a HERS rater all day long. It's great to have a cop, traffic cop on a job site. So, uh, so another thing for the insulation contractor. So, so today's builder, the builder advisor today for the energy code is the home energy rater. It's the HERS rater. That HERS rater is doing all the design analysis. That HERS rater is coming to the builder with good, better, best compliance paths and then it gives to the, uh, the, the head of purchasing and ops and they crunch the numbers and they come back and say, I like this one because it's my least cost path. Now, in, in the current day process, that HERS rater is doing everything. They're doing energy modeling, looking at uh, solutions, they're doing inspections, and they're even doing rebate processing if you're in a utility program. So they're doing all that paperwork, which is a nightmare, paperwork sinkhole. They're doing all of that for the rater. Um, and the rater's on site doing inspections. They're really, the spectators in this process, it's probably a harsh term, is the HVAC contractor, plumber, the framer, um, and the insulation contractor. That HERS rater's defining what your scope of work's gonna be. So, for the insulation contractors in states that maybe aren't fully off performance path, so states like Pennsylvania, New York, um, Ohio, Minnesota, 
I have a lot of homes that are following a prescriptive path. So what we try to teach and coach some of our willing installation contractors is that, hey, you should start inspecting your own work before you leave that job so you're not beholden to the HERS rater number or another trade coming up and screwing up your air seal package. Before you leave the job, you should put a blower door on that house so you know what the air leakage number is. Um, and the rater is only required traditionally, besides California, where you're doing Energy Star, where it recalls for it, the DOE Zero Energy Ready Home, LEED, and the ERI path. That's only where the codes and programs hardwire a rater. Most building departments around the country, exception of California and maybe Florida, they're happy to take a duct leakage number and an envelope leakage number from anybody. The builder's got to sign off on it. So, so we, you know, BPI has some trainings on very basic uh, duct leakage and envelope testing. So we do that for customers. So do other product manufacturers. Um, so hard to read, but this is a brochure that we have on all the different trainings that we do for some of our customers. This one right here is the infiltration and duct leakage test. It's not like a whole week long course classroom because you know you don't have the time to send your crews to go do that stuff. You're, it's blower door basics, how to calibrate the blower door and duct blaster basics. Uh, and when you're doing the blower door, whether you have the attic hatch open and closed and all kinds of other things you need to be aware of. So we do that for a lot of our customers. Uh, we also do, in some markets, we have a healthy home evaluator if that's required. Typically, and that's uh, affordable housing or public housing where they want to have that kind of assessment, not single family detached. Uh, we'll do HVAC. So the other challenge is the HVAC contractors, you know, I think it's two tons. I think you need two tons in your house as opposed to doing the load calculations to figure out what you really need. We'll do trainings on manual J and manual D for the ACA manuals. Um, I've been through that and I realized why I failed calculus two or three times, and I went into architecture school. So, but these are very, very comprehensive, very good trainings that we offer to our customers, as do other manufacturers. Uh, uh, certifications for refrigerant charge, um, the NATE trainings for HVAC. So on the business side, I talked about earlier, like, hey, people don't know what their P&L, they don't know if they're profitable, they don't know what their margins look like. We'll do business coaching. Uh, we will do market and lead generation for, for subcontractors. Traditionally, those guys who are going through existing homes and need to kind of do that. And we do in-home sales training. So how do you sell? Husband and wife are at the table. The kids are going crazy. They want to be fed. How do you sell at a kitchen table and close? So we'll help with, do with some of those. So trends that are coming, that are in your mirror, uh, that are coming at you. And this is not doom and gloom, uh, but this is... You need to be aware of what's coming. Most of them all related to climate change issues. So a lot of issues that deal with climate come from Europe, Canada, California, and back east. Okay? So we've got climate change legislation happening right now in the States. We don't know what the impact's going to be. But generally, it's going to have a market impact on job types and sizes and products you use and don't use. Embodied carbon codes, so British Columbia, Vancouver, they're getting into what's the embodied carbon of, me, of the making of this bottled water or this two by four or this piece of sheetrock or this insulation. And there's going to be numbers hang on, hung on all these things. And that's going to have an impact of what gets specified, ordered, and purchased. Uh, electrification of homes, that's coming in California. There's a big trend towards electrification for a variety of different statutory goals. So that's going to have a massive impact. Um, you're going to see uh, solar and battery being brought into homes more and more. Now, as an it's no more gas. Yeah, that's it. That's, that's it. So um, passive house is a European concept of, of really, really um, low load homes, R30 walls, R65 attics. That's going to be, that's, that's going to get market penetration in multifamily, affordable housing, commercial. It's going to be a long generation before you start seeing it in single family anytime soon. Resilient design, resiliency, that's all about designing for uh, disasters, flood, fires, and you name it. That's going to have a ripple effect in the codes and how you build, and your insurance underwriting and your mortgages. So those mortgage companies and insurance companies are going to be looking at their risk. So if you're not building to resilient design, you may not get a mortgage, you may have some pain in your, pro in your mortgage process. Fire hardening, that's the wildland fire codes that we've seen in California. We're going to see some local ordinances go above the state code. 
So that's, you know, that's, that's going to be interesting. So here's what builders are asking for. But at the end of the day, I was like, OK, what do you really need? So on new codes that go live, they, really, they just want to know what's new. Don't give me a full day training by some geek, energy code geek or building code geek. To, and I glaze over. I don't comprehend it. I, I feel stupid. Just tell me what I, I was doing today and what I have to do tomorrow based on a new code. Uh, and non glaze over plain English language, if they can. Ideally, from a peer um, that's already been through it, like a fellow builder or trade contractor. That's what they would like to have. Um, explain the why of the code change, but only if I ask. Don't spend forever explaining why this went from this to this. Again, if I ask. So, Again, there was a little bit more flavor in some of these uh, interviews. They want pictures. They want graphics. They want do's and don'ts. This is how you do a wall. This is how you seal your ducts. You know, don't do it this way. Do it this way. Very simple. Because their trades, they want it laminated. They want it on the site. They want to put it on a ring clip and a chain on a job site in Spanish and English. Um, a one a one pagers for builders and trades training. I want a two hour maximum train, two hour max training, not all day. I want it in my locale or by my supplier. I'd like to do a webinar, but guess what? I'm going gangbusters from 6 o'clock in the morning to 7 o'clock at night. I might like to have them archived so I can look at them later while I'm doing all my billing. Um, or I could have my team, my team meeting, I could have my team go through this whole thing. Um, and again, they want to hear from their peers. They don't want to hear from some person they perceive has never been on a job site. <laughs> um, uh, code compliance and inspection. So um, they would like inspectors to be consistently wrong or consistently right. Just decide. Um, and fix the wrong and right later. So in um, Washington, D.C. area, uh, I formed a little group from the Virginia Building Code Officials Association. Started with them, about five or six different jurisdictions. And we got from some home builders their typical problems, like um, the structural code on how often do you have to have a post on a fence deck and rail. And the code, the building inspectors want this big post for your railing. I'm like, no, no, no. If you read the code, actually, all you have to do is put a little footer on the bottom rail to carry that load, and you're good to go. Uh, so we, get to, we collect all these different pain points for the builders. And then we'll go in, and we'll sit with our building departments and get them to be consistent on the code application. Uh, they want quarterly uh, meetings with the building code officials. They, they don't want the I gotcha punitive uh, inspections. They would like coaching and mentoring inspections. Um, they would like to know, uh, they would like architects to know the code. They would like building the co code officials to actually own a copy of the code. I, I found out it's not uncommon for the code official not to have a copy of the code. Now, the building department's like, hey, we got limited resources, and these are $200 a book. So, um, architects, I had to put this in a positive about the architects as opposed to the negative that I heard. Architects ask for and welcome advice as opposed to figuring and pretending they know when they don't know. And I'm married to an architect, so I'd be very careful. Um, architects with humility. That's another thing that they've asked for. So anyway. Yeah. Uh, so you're at the Home Builder Show. If you're a builder, you've got three days. You can walk around, come to, and figure out with suppliers, hey, can you help me out? Some of them can, some of them can. I guess beyond selling product, which we do, uh, everybody does, if there's a way that we could help with capacity building, business 101, finance, and really, we don't have to go do it. We just have to retain someone to come in and go do that for you. Uh, that makes you a better customer. You pay your bills better, hopefully, things like that. So these are some things that the builders are, are, are asking for. Host these webinars, do hands-on training um, you know, for a certain trade at a, at a supply yard on doing shingles the right way. Right? It shouldn't be rocket science, but that's what they're asking for. They would like building departments to be their partner as opposed to their adversary. Now, flip side is that a lot of builders and subs aren't going in and saying, hey, buddy, can you teach me about this stuff? It's, it's, it's kind of adversarial. So, so they would like no surprises on co uh, policy changes. So often, a building department will all of a sudden switch out how they're going to um, uh, apply part of the code. And, and, and that has not been broadcasted. Um, Lastly, it's a, how to, for builders, you need to teach your trades how to be advocates for themselves. And you should just reward folks who, are give, who help you on that. So that's all I've got.